I am delighted to be joined by my mate from back home, Dan from Berry Tomorrow, just for the purposes of letting everyone know we are seven hours from the release of the new album, Cannibals. Uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, man. Like, yeah, I can't believe it's actually here. I keep posting stuff like, how the hell am I... Um, how the hell am I going to get through the two days or the <laughs> two hours or whatever it is left? And, uh, and you know, we're, we're there. We're, we're nearly there. The anticipation is real. Um, and I can't wait, really. The situation, does that make time go slower as well? Like, there's one thing, when you've put everything into this body of work, and it's it's a really fascinating album, which we'll get to very shortly, but, like, um, when you're sat on this record and time is moving as slowly as it is doing at the moment, does it make, has it made the, the weight a little bit more strenuous? Yeah, I mean... Every band that ever talks to you bees will be will say that the worst period of time you can ever have is the point where you receive the record back from a producer or a mixer and go, yeah, that's the one. Like, and then releasing any kind of songs, it seems like such a cruel and long wait. So, like, when you get to a stage where you have it and you're so close, and that we had to move at pace with any kind of decisions when it came to, um, you know postponing it or pushing it back or anything like that it just makes it such a long process but like you know i think it made it slightly easier that everyone else was in the same boat it wasn't one of those things where you're in a band and you're like damn it's the label's fault or it's the it's our fault we made a mistake on something it was kind of one of those things where you everyone's in the same boat it's all done for um kind of equity reasons um we didn't want people not to be able to receive the record physically which is a huge part of our music. I think people forget that in metal music is that you know it's not all about digital. Actually, we sell a lot of physical CDs or vinyls or picture books or whatever we've done. And like, it just felt a bit wrong to us that all the distribution had kind of shut down and uh, and not being able to to get people the record and other people having it. it. Just felt a bit wrong. So I'm glad that's alleviated. But we're in no better position to play live shows. So. <laughs> yeah. Still, yeah. So, like, uh, first, firstly, just in case anyone is not familiar with Berry Tomorrow, what you just said about physical product makes complete sense because I can't, I genuinely can't think of a more fan-friendly band than Berry Tomorrow. <laughs> and, and if and if people have parted with their hard-earned money for something, then you want everyone to have the same experience in the moment together. I'm sure. But what is fascinating about Cannibals and where we're going to go today? is I think this is maybe the first Berry Tomorrow album that is truly influenced by Berry Tomorrow. Because this is an <laughs> album this is an album that digs into various parts of your past. And mm. therefore I think it's important for us to go back to when you had a bit of a breakthrough in the UK, which is when Lionheart happened from Union of Crowns. Yeah. Um when Lionheart happened, because you'd been grafting for years, you'd been doing the touring circuit for years yeah. before that point. Yeah. What changed with that song and why? I mean, I think for us, you know, we, at that point we were, I think Lionheart was kind of our lowest, or I suppose the in peaks and troughs of our band's career. I mean, a lot of people will latch on to, you know, the time Berry Tomorrow were going to quit and, and stuff like that. Everyone latches onto that kind of stuff. But like, at the end of the day, we were, albeit had done the years we hadn't overtly done the like rise and fall if that makes sense we were kind of like portraits had done some things we'd gone out to the states arguably maybe a bit too quick in our band's career like um you know we just got out there and we played shows and we just grafted and, and played the music and booked shows at the end of tours so we could keep on touring and all that kind of all the vans in bands uh, the beds in band, vans kind of vibe and uh and then we kind of got to a, a period of time, obviously, where we um, we had a bit of a falling out with our then label and management, and it just caused us to be in that horrible situation like any band. We're not unlike a lot of bands, um, and a lot of bands that have been around for a long time have had this, where you're in that position where you haven't got any new material. Um, we had, at that point, no management or label. And we were kind of in that position where we were like, we really don't know what to do. We hadn't even had like been critically acclaimed at all at that point. Um, people really didn't know who we were. Um, I never forget, or never forget portraits coming out. And I think it was perhaps Kerrang or something that had Metalcore is Dead as a title, and portraits was featured in that album in that uh, thing. And we were like, 
Oh, good news. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm glad that we've just released our debut album. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we were like, good news. Um, and I think for Lionheart, that was just a, like a, an amalgamation of all those feelings. We were pissed off, dude. We were we were young and like I was like nine, no, 21 when the album came out. I was pissed off. I was, you know, I just wanted to show the fans in a song that we were about them, you know. And, and mm. that was probably the first time in our career where I hadn't just been writing the usual metalcore. We're all in this together. Fight the man. All that kind of stuff. It was more of a you know, uh, an ode to the fans, which was, I think, connected us there, man. And obviously it had been, you know, 2009 to then 2012 when we released that. It'd been a long time since we'd even entered a studio. So mm -hmm. then when we release a song that sounds like current music at the time and it sounded heavy and it had really well-recorded vocals and I think people were then like, oh, like this is a new band. Like, do you know what I mean? It was like, it was such yep. a change in in us and i think what it did i said this on an interview the other day i think what it kind of did was like create very tomorrow's sound which I, it sounds weird thinking about it retrospectively but we were like we weren't that before you know we were an old school UK i agree band, grew up with bands like kill uh, kill switch but uk bands were like six and johnny truant and architects and like they were the bands that we were like linked with you know we were like yeah we love johnny truant they're our favorite band and all that kind of stuff and then when we released Lionheart, that was more like, well, we've got our own path to take now. And that was the start of that journey, really. Mm. So when I say to you that this record, Cannibals, feels like it's influenced by Berry Tomorrow, it, it, it's the first time that I've heard you go back to the well on that sound. Like when, it, when the record gets to Dark Infinite at the end, I was like, this is like old school berry tomorrow and it, it's it, like what do you think that's fair and if it, if it is what makes what makes a band this far into their career start to reflect upon itself i think it's hard though man i think like i think it's easy to as someone objectively listening to it to feel that because i think you know because it's such an introspective view of like my personal stuff that i've gone through i think it's really hard not to be pulled into that and say you know the musical direction perhaps is in that way or bury tomorrow as a band i think that's the difficulty man isn't it of compartmentalizing members of a band and viewing a band as a you know as a as five individuals playing metal music and wanting to be in a big metal band which is what we do yeah. you know that's our business we're not in the business of we want to stay playing the same things i want to headline festivals man i want to be in a big band like that's that's what i joined the, I, well, I joined this band because i love music i realized that we had something special and continued to do it for 15 years so you know uh, and so it's hard i think to put that on the shelf when you write an album which is probably you're right for the first time lyrically and thematically and this is for the first time, even beyond portraits and our first EP and everything. Um, this is the first one where I've almost self selfishly looked inwards for influence rather than taking influence from whether it's fans or situations or the environment or whatever I'm around. This is the first album that I went, oh, I'm going to write every single song about what I've gone through, you know, and, and I think that's new for people. I think, you know. I've seen some of the reviews for the album. <laughs> I'm not, I keep my eye on those reviews. And, uh, and there's a what are they saying? There's a lot of positivity. A lot of people think it's the best best stuff we've done. I would say probably 90% of people. And then other people are saying the usual stuff, like, you know, Barry Tomorrow's not reinventing the wheel, blah, 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 blah. Like, at the end of the day, man, those critics are right. We're not. Like, we're not. <laughs> Fundamentally, we made a decision a long, long time ago that we just want to be the best metalcore band on the planet. I don't want to be some you know technical band that people are like oh wow they reinvented their sound on every album mm -hmm. like i just want to be the best at what we do you know and there's a niche there which i think is really really good you know when you look at and we'll possibly touch into it but like when you look at like the bands in the uk that are kind of the top of the game really and you know, I, I put architects up there i would put bring me up there but they're on just another stratosphere of big but like i put architects up there as a huge metal band seminal metal band that i think when people look back they're going to say that's the band that, that did it all and um, then you've got sleeps and us and you've kind of got and when you look at those three you know we're three bands that sell out 
venues that none of us in any of the bands thought we'd ever get to selling out whether it's Wembley Brixton or Roundhouse or you know our next one's possibly Brixton and <laughs> yes I, mate. I, I like look back and I'm just like that's ridiculous mate and there's a reason for it and I truly believe this piece until to the end of this band's career I believe it's because we've all got our pocket that we've sat into which architects have got that well they've always had tech metal and being the most ridiculously talented in, individuals on the planet um, they've got this now ethereal kind of symphonic part of their music, which then crushes in with the heavy parts, which I would call them more melodic metal. Then you've got Sleeps, who are like punk, hardcore, DIY till they die. Yeah. Like, great production, but they're punks. Like, that's what they like doing. Like, they live for this, you know, and we sit in that metalcore pocket of 2006 level metalcore. So, you know, if we're, if we're in that pocket, why would we, when we're at this stage, suddenly go, you know what, we're we're going to do exactly kind of what we is the opposite of what we've done lyrically look at our music and go you know what like we're just going to do it for ourselves mm. that that just seems nonsensical really mm. one as a business move because you've got loads of people that like you and two as like give credit to those people that listen to us back in portraits and union and you know earthbound black flame runes like you go back to all of those albums and you go well a lot of people would take songs out of there as their favorite Barry Tomorrow songs. And I, I uh, suppose to me, I'm really happy in the fact that when I read some of these reviews that, um, they kind of go back and go like, well, man on fire, Lionheart, um, black flame, earthbound, last light. They're all, they're my favorite Barry Tomorrow songs. And you know what? That's fucking awesome, man. Like <laughs> I'm never going to sit back and say you've these, these people that are say criticizing or not enjoying it as much as they enjoyed those. <laughs> amazing we still got those albums and we still play them live so it's like you know if people can go back to an album that's 10 years old and, and like those songs better than they like the new stuff then more power to them and like i'm i'm all for it it's all buried tomorrow you know yeah well let me let me, let me give you my take on that right because i know you as individuals as well as musicians and i think bury tomorrow's music is as honest as it gets and it's a reflection of who you are as people. You love your band. You love your band. You've lived your band with your fans in this together. Everything that you've just said makes total sense when you actually know you as people, not interviews and the rest of it, like as people when we've hung out and stuff. Every one of you loves your band and loves the elements that go into it. So why fuck with something that you love, people love, and you you and not only that it's not like the quality isn't changing like the the last couple of berry tomorrow records are the best berry tomorrow mm. records just just my just my personal take yeah, man. On like, that. I, you know i've i've had various conversations over the last like you know obviously the last couple of weeks but like the last months or years of this band's career you know and and it doesn't matter whatever you talk about. You know, someone brought up the other day, you know, there's a lot of this um, culture where people are realising that actually a lot of people in bands are scumbags. And um, you know what? Yeah, they're right. A lot of people are scumbags in bands. There's a lot of them around. And I know that's like a kind of um, diverting away from what we're talking about. But that is the point, man. Like, there's a reason why we love our fans. There's a reason why we love this band. And it's because we got into it to make music. I didn't get into this to be a rock star. I didn't get into this to be hailed as the best screamer in the world. The whole sense of screaming for a living just blows my fucking mind, if I'm honest with you. Um, but, you know, I got in this because I love, I love melodic parts of music. I love singing. I love heavy breakdowns. And I love connecting with people. And that's, that's the fundamental reasons why I'm in a band. They tick my boxes. When I go home at night, and I, I've done a tour, I can sit there and go, you know what, we were ethical, we were moral, we stood for the right things we needed to do, and we weren't full of shit, and that straight up is what I want from our music. I want people to go, do you know what, they're not making music because they desperately want to get on tour with the brand new cool band in the scene. Like, I don't care about being cool. It doesn't bother me. Like, at the end of the day, I make music that people like and that's cool and i don't i don't care if it's got 25 bands stood side stage clapping us along because they're desperate because to get on tour with us or put us on tour that doesn't bother us like as you know bees we've never been the the, the band favorite we've never been the media favorite we've just been a band that plods on does what we do best gets better and better with our with our instruments and how we are and 
you know and you know what the long game's proving quite nicely we're not doing we ain't doing bad numbers <laughs> but, but can I, i'll give i'll give you my take on that right which is i use you as an example to young british bands and that is Berry tomorrow are honest and they work hard and they care about their fans and when all of those things are combined all of those other details are exactly that. They're just details on the outside when you're doing what you're doing with your people. And being a Berry Tomorrow fan is fun. When you come out and play festivals and the Champions League music plays before you come out and things like that, like you feel part of something, that little extra spark of something. To bring this back to cannibals, though, and to bring this back to you individually, when you say you get introspective on this record, just from us being mates, even me being on the other side of the world, I've noticed your day job has changed and you're involved yeah. in care with people. Mm. Do you think that plays into you writing about yourself a bit more on this record? I think, you know, I've always been in healthcare since, you know, since I joined this band. I joined this band when I was just 17 and joined the NHS when I was uh, two days after my 18th birthday, actually, I joined the NHS. And I've worked in it for the whole period of time that I've been in a band. Um, and I continue to work into it now. I think, I think what fundamentally changed was what I realised about myself, which is what I kind of mentioned there, is that I'm not bothered about stature or position or influence or whatever that, you know, what ever comes along with power and being in a band what i'm influenced about is inspiring others to just be good humans inspiring others to be able to compassionately talk to one another um to be vulnerable to be honest i mean i think for me like um i think what i used to do was say well this is my nhs work and this is my band work and i go away on tour and i'm danny the frontman and i come back and i'm daniel the the worker for the nhs and i think over the last couple of years what i've done is realized that they're both the same end you know i've transitioned into a role where i am you know speaking publicly for the nhs i am facilitating workshops for well-being and mental health and psychological safety and i'm challenging the status quo um so what i'm doing in, in the nhs is basically going to executives and saying the way you've done it guys is wrong you need to listen to the people on the ground you need to understand that this is how it feels because i've been there and worked in those letter folding jobs for six months you know and and for me like that's the same thing as i'm trying to do in the band is challenge the status quo like i'm trying to challenge when we may not be the most revolutionized band when it comes to our um you know technical prowess or how we move and change with albums which i respect dude i'm not putting anyone that changes their music um off a pedestal and don't think that that's an incredibly brave, brave thing to do because it is a bloody brave thing to do but what it is is about me challenging the media and provoking and being like an instigator and, and challenging other bands and kind of being like you know this whole vip stuff we don't need to go into it i've spoken about it enough um, <laughs> people get bored of me talking about it but like, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, dude, it's like, that's the same thing. It's it's an enabler. I am the person that can just stick that knife in slightly and go, you know what? Well, guys, you didn't care about us back then. So why are you caring about us now? And there are very few pocketed people that I I respect enough, um, yourself being one of them, um, which I care about their opinion. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's purely because of the other relationship aspect of it, not, um, you know, colleagues or, or peers or whatever you call people in the industry that just seems mental but yeah <laughs> colleagues and peers i'd probably call I'll, them. I, others you take friends friends yeah there's that part of it you know and, and i think when i realized that that all came together as one and i am one person it just unlocked part of me with this especially with this album and coming off the back of black flame which was a cap off to five other albums you know black flame was the album that was like if you could ever it was the same thing so it's a weird concept so we've always been a fans band we've always promoted our fans we've always said that they're the most important thing to us but we'd never done an album that was fully like about that you know it was unifying of that lionheart was the closest thing and we've never done it since black flame was that that was it that was the music sonic representation that our fans mean more to us than anything else on this planet so that kind of put to bed those 14 years and those five albums and our, our multitude of fans 
So it get it opened up a world where on the latter part of the Black Flame tour, second tour that we did, I did those safe spaces and I um, gave people opportunity to talk to a mental health practitioner and I discussed kind of what I'd been through. And it just unlocked this world of like, well, now I'm free to do that. One, I'm the wellest I've ever been from a resilience perspective. And two, I've got more knowledge of what I'm talking about now when it comes to mental health. But then also we're in the best possible position to be able to unlock that in this record. Our fans trust us that we're going to make banger Berry Tomorrow albums that's not going to suddenly warp off and Dan's doing spoken word for the entire album. (laughs) (laughs) People trust us, you know, and we trust them that they will be able to take such a serious topic and, you know, and and support us through that you know it's important that our fans support imagine releasing an album right there's a monologue about your depreciated mental health and every single person turns around and goes that was the worst thing they ever released i mean jesus yeah. christ yeah. It's not, you don't need it you have to have an honest uh, an honest look at yourself and think oh is this and also you know bees this ain't you know the other guys this ain't a it's not just a danny berry tomorrow album that i write everything and that's it cool there's plenty of bands out there it's, you know, you can only need to look at like Beartooth, like Caleb's really, really talented individual does it all. It's him. You know, that's Caleb. Yeah. But for us, like we're five individuals that have put in blood, sweat and tears. Arguably, some of the members have put in more effort than me and they've given their sixth album to me. Like that, that's what's happened. I'm the one that people are asking about. It's my mental health that they're asking about, which is is a brave thing to do. And I'll always respect them for that, mate. They're my brothers. Until I die, they'll be my brothers, you know. And with that vulnerability, Dan, like I think I think it says a lot about you as a confident human being that it is it's not just talking it like a, like mental health has become a conversation piece. And that is a great thing, a really great thing. But there's talking it and putting floating the idea out and then there's being about it putting yourself on a record like this um yeah, it's completely th- different man is, is that a weird yin and yang to walk to be confident enough to be vulnerable enough yeah you're absolutely right mate like that is that you couldn't put it better myself to be honest like you know for me the safe spaces were a massive part of that that was a really cool transition into kind of saying i'm going to put my actual money where my mouth is you know i paid for those those sessions i set them all up with help from some amazing people out there um and then it kind of was just a revelation of like when i was writing the songs i was obviously in a good place where the songs are actually i didn't make a conscious decision for the first six songs to to write them purely about my mental health but i obviously just was that was the zone i wanted um and then um and i just think for me it's really easy for bands to put um to put a tweet out and say let's talk about mental health it's the easiest thing in the world like it's it's like i could put one out right now please and say oh you know what we should do we should talk about mental health and then not respond to anybody not talk about it not do anything else and feel gratified for the fact um there's a lot of things going on you know social injustices racial injustices on this planet at the moment where a lot of people are doing that and they're virtue hunting and uh but what i wanted to do was how can i possibly tell people to be vulnerable honest open if i'm not going to use my biggest platform to to do that you know like being on stage is a huge platform being on social media and being a front man of a band is a huge platform talking to the media about stuff is a huge platform but my biggest platform university is that every single person who listens to our band will hear those lyrics so why wouldn't i do that you know it just seemed a lot and it's brave like i, I that's one thing i pat my shoulder my my uh, back on is that you know that's cool i'm glad we did that but it's, it's more brave for a band than it is for me it's easy for me to do it mm. i just wrote lyrics i did what i mm. do best i just write lyrics for a band but like the bravery is from the band's position and the label and the management and everyone that's involved in a record coming out it's not just the band like we all sat down and kind of went okay this album sounds like we're going to this part of dan's life now are we all okay with this? And the main question that was asked is, Dan, are you okay to talk about this for the next year and a half, arguably now two and a half years of your life? Like, um, you know, this being something that is really, really personal. And, you know, I, I'm really glad that they asked that question. But, but yeah, you know, we're ready. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back 
to where that left first. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about safe spaces. And I know that it's a confidential and intimate environment for people to share things. But what did you learn from your fans from doing that? What did you learn from the safe spaces? I suppose I learned the power of the power of group enablement, which was like th we had sessions, dude, where they people were coming out as gay for the first time. People were coming out as transgender for the first time that they had those tendencies. Someone came out um, and spoke about abuse that they'd never, ever spoken about um, in their whole life, sexual abuse from when they were younger. And all that could do for me is just be humbled that people would be so honest and in that honesty dude like it comes from like it's like a waterfall it's like the minute one person's honest everybody's honest and that just set me in motion really of, of vulnerability being such a powerful tool um because you know the world is is the world was bloody carved by masculinity and misogyny and you know, like, it's really, really important that we try and smash that to pieces as much as we can and, and show vulnerability because if you can stop something, there's a load of studies around um, PTSD and trauma. And there's mm. a lot of studies, especially at the moment around that, where they're talking about if you can stop something in its tracks and actively talk through it logically and you can implement tools in your life, it will never manifest itself as anything, like, traumatic later on. Um, it won't affect you in that way that perhaps leaving it... Um, you know, and you thinking about those things, that anxiety that it causes. And I, and I just thought, you know, perhaps those sessions were a real opportunity for people to kind of go, what a step, you know, what a first step on a way to recovery um, or not recovery or just self-discovery, I suppose, is a better term for it. But, yeah, it was just a I can't be any more than just humbled with, with that kind of stuff, man. Like the fact that they trusted me with that as well is really, really big, you know. And when it comes to looking inwards, Dan, is Cannibals an album of self-love or self-loathing? <laughs> uh, loving myself enough to be honest about it, but it's certainly not a happy album. Um, mm. You know, because I'm not, you know, I'm not self-loving, mate, if I'm honest with you. I, the brain is a horrible thing. We're self-depreciating, self um self-destructive as you know as anyone you know i've got imposter syndrome i've got anxiety i've got chronic depression like that is my life and it will be my life forever more unfortunately that's just the way my brain's wired but but for me that's okay you know that's all right it's all right that i have peaks and troughs and sometimes i feel okay and other times i don't and it's how i deal with it which is the the, the big question um so like you know and in that you know i'll be lying to tell you if there's not a lot of self-loathing in that album because there is of course there is if i'm talking about things like imposter syndrome where i feel like a fraud and i don't feel comfortable in my own skin or i'm f talking about depression where i can't construct a future well yeah so like for, for me it's it's a, a reflective kind of look on that and you know it's really hard for me to to say that when i listen back to the album i'm not sometimes when i'm in a good resilient place amazed by how low i got you know which is quite a quite a daunting thing really when you're when you sit there and you think about it and but that's also kind of a time stamp for me it's 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 a good chance for me to kind of go you know what you need to just be careful sometimes that you don't get into that position you know well, let's because the night is darkest before the dawn. I always prefer getting to the happy ending. But <laughs> when you when you find yourself on the floor, Dan, um, what do you find yourself on the floor about? If that's not too personal a question to ask, it's not too personal, man. Like, and <laughs> I'd be a. Uh... I'd be loathed if uh, someone didn't ask me about my mental health and uh, after releasing yeah. an album about my <laughs> mental health. So don't be too too worried about asking those questions. You know what? Like, mine's really weird. If I'm honest, bees. Like, so I have um, I have depression, um, a chronic depression. So it's it's a long period of time. And if I'm honest, nothing really triggers it in. It's more of just a general state of flux. Um, yeah. I've also got generalized anxiety disorder. So I've got two kind of cruel ones, which are constant, really. So generalized anxiety disorder is better known as that kind of chimp or that searching um, where my brain will, if I'm in a, a height of kind of fight or flight, my brain will do like a searching probing thing where it tries to find something to be anxious about. Um, that can be anything, really. That can be health. That can be feelings. I was quite a... Um, 
when I was younger, and this is going deep, actually, I'm giving you the scoop here. Um, <laughs> like, when I was younger, I was uh, I was assaulted with a with a knuckle duster, basically. When I was younger, 20, 24 year old guy, and I was sixteen years old, walking my girlfriend from a bus stop, and the age old, the age old rocker thing where you're you got long hair and you're skinny, and someone comes up to you, and the insult was you're gay. My my insult back was um, so. I walked my girlfriend to my bus stop, so that seems odd. Um, <laughs> and I think I remember the guy was like, do you want to fight me? Um, and I called him a paedophile because he was 25 and I was coming out of school. So that probably wasn't the best, best response you could say to a chav at that time. He had his um, he had his girlfriend with him and his dog and I believe a kid as well, if I remember correctly. So that's the kind of level of human being we were talking about. And uh, and I turned around and I turned back and he slipped on this three ring thing which had spikes on it and he just smashed me in the face and I split all my nose open so my nose was over here and I had a cut from here to here um, and I remember just looking at him like alright cool we're going to fight then and he just went white and ran off and for a long long time I was super angry about stuff and life and the next day I shaved my head um, and like lots of my other kind of stuff started so my eating disorders and my relationship with food and working out and everything was just really unhealthy at that time. And I think from there, I kind of just pushed down my emotions. And I was like, nah, I didn't cry at funerals. You know, I went to close family funerals, didn't get happy about birthdays or seeing anyone. I was just this, like, plateaued. And um, and that's not really a healthy place to be. And it works. It fundamentally works. And it's an, a great way to not, not show any emotion. But it's not a great way to address the fact that I probably had underlying anxiety issues and depression anyway. Um, and it was really the biggest point where I, was, I remember feeling depression. And when I retrospectively look back was when we did the Architects tour. Um, and it was actually the tour that they did um, post-Tom. Um, it was the first tour they came back, which was a really emotional tour anyway. But it wasn't really about that. But it was one of those things where I found myself going on stage in front of all those amazing fans. And it was beautiful and, and unreal. And I, I, I felt nothing. I felt nothing. The whole tour. Nothing. I played Brixton Academy. I felt absolutely nothing. I didn't feel excited. I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel nervous. I just was living a life of like watching myself. Um, and mine was actually from a point of weirdly, I think a trigger point for me when I really started addressing my emotions was when I got engaged. And that's a really, really hard thing to not feel happy about, um, luckily. And that like peaked. And then I just had this cataclysmic just drop down um, because I couldn't control my emotions. I, was, I just was in this state of you know, oddity where I was just in panic all the time. Um, and it's not about being engaged. A lot of people when I say that like, oh, right. Here he goes, <laughs> commitment of phobe. But it wasn't, you know, it was just generally about not being able to, you know, rationalize what I was feeling. Um, and then that opened the floodgates. <laughs> that was that was a, that was good fun really trying to battle with that. Um, so yeah, I mean and nowadays really anything, it can be when I'm just shattered and putting in everything, you know, I'm a busy man bees, like and it's not for yeah. the band. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. I'm a busy bloke, I do a lot of things. A lot of people are though. You know, a lot of people are I'm not saying I'm any more special, but, you know, I work in the NHS at a high grade, uh, especially over this COVID time. It's been, I've been doing 80 hour, 70 hour, 80 hour weeks um, and trying to promote an album coming out. I'm shattered, you know, and I killed myself the other day, kind of slipping into that, you know, psyche of, am I all right? Um, I'm worried about things, you know, that wasn't an okay day. Um, but I think the difference is, mate, is that, when you recognize it and you can say it vulnerably. And I put out a tweet the other day saying, just didn't go the way I wanted it to go. I just feel like everything's unraveling slightly. And that was a really great timestamp for me to then check myself and kind of go, right, what do you need to do then, Dan? Do you need to do some meditation? Do you need to do some mindfulness? Do you need to kind of logically work through this so you will be better? Or do you just need some time off? Um, and it may be one of the three or it may be all of the three. And it's just about working that out, I think, which which makes it easier to deal with, you know. Where, where do you, where do you find catharsis, mate? Like like where's where's the space from that, and how do you get there? Probably um, mine's weird, man. So my condition or how I deal with my condition often makes me feel better when I logically talk about it because I have like intrusive thoughts and OCD thoughts where they're kind of 
a lot of people have it. We've all got a self-deprivating voice sometimes. Um, our voice is generally not our kindest person that you can listen to, really. It's usually the person that's giving you shit. You know, you look mm. horrible or blah, 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 blah. It's never the nicest voice in the world. But I've got an OCD kind of thought around it where it won't stop. It's just a constant, 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 whether it's about body dysmorphia, how I look, imposter about how people are perceiving me as a human being. Um, and so how, what works for me is logically kind of putting, when I'm well, I can't do it when I'm in fight or flight because you just need to pull yourself down a minute. But mm. when I'm well, being able to talk through it with someone and like, so whether it's my wife or whether it's a GP in the past, whether it's therapist, psycho psychologist, I'm lucky I work with psychology now so I can soundboard stuff off people. Um, but it's really like, it's putting it down on paper to go, right, okay, this is why you're feeling that. Or the biggest question fundamentally is, is this something that right now you need to address? Like, is that something that right now you need to do? Because fight or flight is for that. Fight or flight's for mm -hmm. it. A car's coming across the road, you're in the way, you need to run, and your adrenaline needs to go, and it needs to go to the right places so you can jump across the road um, or jump out of the way. Or adrenaline there's a car trapped on uh, and a baby's under it and you need to pick it up and you can somehow and that's an amazing thing about fight or flight adrenaline's a beautiful thing when we use it my fight or flight kicks into in the randomest places and so really logically working out that and going right okay do i fundamentally need to use that energy to change something now and sometimes i do sometimes it's work sometimes it's having a conversation with someone maybe i've pissed someone off or i perceive that i pissed someone off so actually doing it by having that conversation and going have i pissed you off are you okay that will stop the the cyclical thoughts other times you just got to let it go you've just got to have a metaphorical so what box in your brain where you can kind of just go you know what i haven't got the energy the time or the will to deal with that right now um and what would i tell other people to do and that sometimes is cathartic process of going how would i talk to myself if i was looking looking at myself sat on that chair and that can be a real cathartic process for me to work that out. And giving people advice, dude, like, you know, I pride myself. We talked about being in a band, talked about striving to be the best I can possibly be. I want to be the best front man in the world. That's what I want to be. I've always wanted to be that. I've wanted to connect with people more than anyone else connects with people. Um, I want to be the best person in the NHS. I want to be a director of the NHS. I want to be the first one that looks like me. I want to work for a council, you know, and I want to change the lives of people. That's what I want to do fundamentally. And with that my mental health i want to be knowledgeable and i want to learn about it and i want to have you know great knowledge so then i can pass that kind of knowledge on to other people and it helps them as well as well as helping me it's like one of your steps mm. to well-being is giving and in that steps to well-being it's giving a part of yourself or your knowledge onto other people can fundamentally physiologically change how you think as well yeah well conceptually cannibals just falls into place like <laughs> at the, at the end the of that cathartic thing i could ever do like indulgent self-indulgent or, ca or cathartic the, uh, <laughs> i'll be the, i'll be the judge of that and i'll say cathartic like there's no there's not a, there's not a self-indulgent thing about you dan and like if if i may i would never dream on talking on behalf of your fan base but i do talk to your fan base a lot like yeah. a lot of a lot of people who like you like what i do and all yeah. and the passion and the effort that you put in with this stuff like is never unrecognized and mm -hmm. for all of the having to talk about it to the media for the next two years you're going to open so many doors for the people that matter and that to me is all that matters i hope so man i really do and like it's really easy to you know i'll let you be the judge of it but it's really easy to be self-aggrandizing and and go down that slippery slope. So I do make sure that I put it into that box of like, we're also a metal band and that's what we do. Hmm. We make metal music, we make heavy music. And there's a lot of people that will get into us for that. You know, a lot of people, um, a lot of people will just like the tunes and, and like the breakdowns and want to dance with their friends. And you know what? In my head, I can kind of compartmentalize that and go, well, that's helping their mental health and their well-being. So it's all, they don't might, they don't need to connect with me on that level, but, um, if I can do it for anyone, um, a very base level, I just want people to talk 
Like they just need to talk to people. They just need to talk to each other. And they, they don't need to be mental health practitioners. They may not ever need to um, in reach into mental health services. But what they need to fundamentally do is not be scared to talk about feeling a certain way or feeling a bit odd. And because that's the precursor of any kind of downward spiral for sure. Mm. Well, like uh, this is it's a fascinating interview, man. And the record is now out. I can't point this out enough go and check out this record because the thing is for everyone who says about not reinventing the wheel that would be to ignore the blistering run of form that you have been on for the last couple of your records and that continues on this one and for what my word is worth planet uh, uh planet earth, <laughs> planet one, earth. Of, <laughs> one of one of the best metalcore bands and i'm so proud that you're a british band as well are you are you do you feel connected to what's going on in Britain or is Berry Tomorrow an Island? Because I kind of, I see you as like, you're part of the community, but you are your own island in the, yeah, no, let me, let you answer that. And like, do you feel part of things? Yeah, man. I like, I think I, you know, of, of course I'm bloody proud to be a British metalcore band. Like I'm proud to be probably the only band that sounds like us now. And that transcends. Mm. If I'm honest, that transcends any nation. <laughs> like, yeah, you can still listen to Azalea Dying and Kill Switch, but you know what? Like, put it down on record. Like, tell me another band that sounds like Barry Tomorrow because there bloody isn't one. And when people call me generic, that's the only bite back I have when I'm like, <laughs> generic to what? Like, tell me another band that, that sings and screams like we do. Like, you know, you have these amazing bands that are out now. You've got the Polarises and the uh, Make Them Suffers mm. and the uh, Mice and Men's and the uh, Wage Wars and the, like, and who would classify them in that world, undoubtedly, of metalcore, Amity Affliction being another band like that. Mm. Like, but do they sound like us or do we sound like them? No, like, absolutely mm. not. There's no Wage War possibly are the closest i would say because of their speed but they're again it's techie it's like they're a bit more um you know lower tunings and that new school vibe and their both singing vocals are like in that way so you know what like i kind of in that element i think you're right we are our own island and we we stand strong with that but you know we stand arm in arm with with architect and while she sleeps you know we stand arm in arm as a uk band with bleed from within and their new record and like you know what, if more people promoted UK music, we'd be in a far better position than we are. Like, I tell mm. you now, we would be far better. We'd be Australia level, and we're not. Like, we don't have, like, the Australian level, where Amity Affliction is selling out the same size venues as Parkway, Polaris are getting to that stage, yeah. North Lane are getting to that stage. Like, and that is fundamentally for one reason, and that is because the media has gone about their way of promoting every other country over the UK. They have. Um, we we have just received. Let let's put let's break things down. We have just received our first full band cover, and we're a band of six albums and fifteen years experience. We've headlined Coco, sold it out. Headlined Forum, sold it out. We've headlined uh, Roundhouse. We've sort of been a top forty band, three albums deep. We're just probably about to be top ten or top top twenty on this next. Cover. Tell me another band fundamentally that hasn't been on that cover. And it's like, and that for me is just, it says it all. And it's not just us. So under us, you know, there's a whole load of bands that needed that chance and that, you know, that have now probably not, they're not a band anymore because they weren't given that chance. And, and that, and when we, when we, when we speak about the media and when we're, you know, we're, we're vocal about it or we're pissed off about it, it comes, it sounds like it comes from a place of bitterness. And dude, we made peace with that back on Earthbound. Like I made peace with the fact that people, I'm not going to expect handouts from anyone. But I feel sorry for all of those other bands that are in exactly the same boat as us, that aren't the coolest bands in the world, that aren't, you know, a gimmick, you know, that are just making music. And, you know, um, and in that element, I think we've had to be our own island. You know, we've had to do our own things. We can't be, you know, I'm, I don't want to go and watch, fundamentally watch another band and tell them that they're amazing if I don't believe they're amazing just because I want to get on tour with them. And that's not what I'm going to do. I want bands to like us because they like us and they respect us. I don't care if they like our music. I just want them to respect us as human beings. And I think that is, I think that's fundamentally the, what's caused us to have this kind of bayamoth of a, of a fan base where it's like, 
you know what we'll just feed off them and they feed off us and it's great and if we grow we grow but we grow together anyway so it's cool you know Mm. like I, I, the thing is i'm not much of a, a, a like a nationalist at all but i i totally agree with you and the thing with britain is like i don't think it's always been the case for your 15 years as a band but right now there are there is so much brilliant rock music from all facets like mm. if you like your heaviest end and you like employed to serve great if you like the other end of things and there's you know creeper and like now loads have joined the heavier end of things it just feels really fucking great and um it feels like a brilliant place for berry tomorrow to be can i say veterans after 15 <laughs> years now we've said it like uh, people have already said that man we're the veterans but we're veterans with hype which feels very odd mate like this, album <laughs> is, this album's easily the most hyped album we've ever had like which mm. is which is crazy, man. Like Black Flame was really good, and the campaign was solid. Like, and I attribute a lot of of the the campaign of Black Flame not only for the songs, but I attribute a lot to mo mo moving to Music for Nations and Sony and having a bigger reach. And and it was really cleverly done. Like it was the sigil, and it was the fan base, and we and I, it sounds like a big and result, but it was a clever campaign. We did it really yeah. well. We, we were honest and we were open and we were like, it's about you. And we did the Black Flame Band thing. And, you know, everything we did was orientated around fans, which made a lot of sense. It was coherent. Um, with this record, people are just like, oh, my God, this is it. You know, this is the one. And to be a band of 15 years, bro, like, and be veterans, which we are, like, we are, we're old. It's all right. Um, but to be, to be in that world and be, that's cool. That's cool to me. I always wanted to be there. When I look back, Killswitch weren't young. Like, mm. they weren't young bands. They're veterans, you know? And as yeah. they're dying, we weren't young. Like, they were people that had slogged it out for years and had album after album after album. And so, for me to kind of be in that position where people will look to us to create the next big album or the next album of the year for them for Metalcore, I mean, fuck yeah, dude. That's awesome. Like, I'll always respect that because also there's an inherent respect there from people sometimes where it's like, all right, we're not going to tell Barry tomorrow what to be on their next album. And we walk into, my, and I only felt it really over the last few years, but like we walk into festivals now and people know, know us. They, and it's not about knowing our band or like, like loving our music. It's more they, they know BT, we're the constant. And it's not that we're going down. Actually, it's a beautiful thing when you're a, a veteran, a kind of constant, and you're going up. And that's, you know, that's a perfect trifecta of like a successful band, really, you know? Mm. Well, it's a testament to the last five or six years of your band. That's what it is. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, man. And uh, both still here, both getting old. We're veterans. <laughs> yeah, we're veterans. Vet vet yeah, really that's, sure that's it, mate. Veteran, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. We're, we're in it together, mate. Dan, thanks so much for your time, mate. No worries, brother.